good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Very good. It's a small crowd, so hopefully we can get a little bit intimate. I want to see your hands. I would love to hear your questions. Today we'll be speaking about a unique topic, a unique material, and that is exotic skins or exotic reptile leathers. My name is Dr. Daniel Nartouche. Joined with me today are Nicholas Ronderos from BSR, Business for Social Responsibility, and Dr. Patrick Ost from Oxford University. And we're going to be speaking to you about exotics. I don't know how many of you have heard the things we've had to say before. We were here at Linea Palais in February this year, speaking about exotic skins and the benefits of exotic skins. We are conservationists. So I'm affiliated with IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It's the world's oldest and largest conservation organization. And you might be asking yourselves, why would a conservationist be supporting and promoting the sustainability credentials of an industry that results in animals dying? And we've gone into a lot of detail in the past about reptiles. The fact that in the areas they occur, they are exceptionally common, they are often dangerous, and in many cases they are considered pests. So how do we, as conservationists, get local people to conserve this? A crocodile that is eating people's livestock, that is sometimes eating their children, how do we go about that? And how do we protect their habitats? And this system has grown over the last 50 years, and the last 50 years of science has shown that this trade, through this mutualism, is providing these benefits. And that is why we are supporting it. And we've spoken a lot about this in the past, we won't be going into details, but it is underpinned by people like this. It is the livelihoods that are supported, the livelihoods of indigenous people, marginalized communities in the jungles of Borneo and elsewhere, where this foreign currency is assisting them in promoting their lives. And through this circular system, is generating those incentives that help us as conservationists. But today, we don't just want to be speaking about the benefits, we want to be speaking about the good work that's being done to underpin it, that underpins these industries. I should also say, I forgot this slide, but hopefully there's no synthetic material sellers in the audience today, but the reality is we're at a leather fair and the science is unequivocal. The science has been done. The life cycle analyses have been done. And a fossil fuel-based plastic, or often a synthetic leather, do not compare. We all have our own opinions and views, but the facts are, the science and the numbers show that exotic materials are far more sustainable, have a far lower environmental impact than many alternatives, despite what you may hear. And so we've talked about all these benefits, but today we want to be speaking about the good things going on in this industry, because we can't just say, this is an industry that helps people's livelihoods, if at the same time, there are animal welfare issues, there are transparency issues. We need to provide that reassurance, and the industry needs to provide that reassurance that the practices ongoing are good because there is tremendous pressure. This industry needs to be responsible. It needs to show that its practices are not harming wildlife populations, are not resulting in animal welfare issues, are not resulting in illegal trade, and ultimately continue to generate the benefits for people, for habitats, for species that this trade has been doing for the last 50 years. And so without further ado, 
I would like to pass on to Nicholas, who will speak about an initiative, the Southeast Asian Reptile Conservation Alliance, or SARCA, that is doing some of the work to improve practices within this industry. So thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for, for having us and for having Sarka speak at the Green Theater. Uh, thank you so much for your time also. Here, uh, we want to talk about this multi-stakeholder initiative, this collaboration that uh, we manage with uh, the scientific team of Dan and Pat and uh, the support of us, BSR, as, a, as an NGO. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Okay, so SARCA is an organization in which we regroup companies, including large tanneries, brands, uh, scientific organizations such as uh, the ones that Daniel and Pat represent, universities, etc. And we have the goal of building a skin trade that maintains reptile populations. That's a very important goal that supports local and national economies, so that there are livelihoods of you know, farm holds that uh, use these skins for their livelihood, for their household economy. And uh, we also promote principles of welfare of animals, just in any, as in any other trade that uses animals, uh, we're focusing in increasing the, the welfare of the animals. Our objectives are, 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 are multiple, but the key ones are to first understand and assess how the supply chains are used by luxury brands. So to have a lot of transparency, to have a lot of understanding of where are the skins coming from, what are they being used, by whom, where, what is the relationship to landscapes, to biodiversity, etc. Second, to evidence legal trade, offtake, uh, that maintains wild population and the humane treatment of species. So we also want to ensure through, through the working of all these businesses, the large players in the exotic skin trade, the tanneries, etc., to make sure that the skins that are sourced uh, are sourced responsibly. And that's a key element of the work that we're doing. We also demonstrate good practice labor conditions, so the, the conditions that socially are there uh, by the people that are engaged in the supply chain. We we'll also try to ensure viable long-term trade with livelihood impacts, as I just, as I just said. And finally, uh, to like, support the actions of this multi-stakeholder entity uh, to promote sustainable and supply chains and capacity building. In order to guide this process, this this effort of making the exotic skin trade sustainable, responsible, etc., we seek uh, to fulfill five claims uh, as part of the effort. First, we have one compliant trade in terms of reptile species that from Southeast Asia comply with export requirements, that they're sustainable takeoff of these species to help conserve wild populations, and this is a point that Dan and Pat will talk about, how the relationship of using the animals at the same time that it helps conservation. The animal welfare, in the sense that these animals are treated humanely from capture to kill, like in any other trade. Four, that there are environmental and social responsibility, in the sense that we demonstrate the good practice and labor and operational management of uh, the different uh, operations uh, in the field. Finally, as we said, something very important for us is the livelihood support, and is that these trade reptiles support the livelihoods of local people in a, in a, in a, in a healthy economy uh, that, is, that is also important. It is not just uh, something that is done at a factory. It is very important to understand, like any, some of other commodities, there are small farm holds or other individuals that at the local level are sourcing these materials. And so the implication is that the trade supports also uh, these, these communities. 
So SARCA, our multi-stakeholder initiative, uh, identify common challenges and, and, and benefits of working together as a multi-stakeholder initiative. We were launching 2018 uh, to, to, to work on the transparency in the supply chain, the conservation science behind it, the capacity for animal welfare and sustainable practices in the process, the protection and enhancement of livelihoods, and to address growing industry concerns by pressure groups. So really to make sure that ultimately what we're doing is done sustainably. That's our main goal, our main purpose of uh, operation since 2018. Finally, mm, we see the benefits of a collective approach, and is one company itself can have access just to, for instance, the suppliers that are within its value chain. If we work collectively and we have all the companies that use the full value chain, we're able to trace more transparency, we're able to understand to a greater detail what are the issues, and we're able also to ensure that the quality and the sustainability is ensured for all. This builds on a common framework for action, which shares goals and objectives of all the members, an alignment on decision-making for the common good, for the benefit of the species and the communities in the industry that are supported, and also to ensure an inclusive approach that minimizes the risk of the lowest common denominator. We're really on a race to the top to increase the sustainability of the exotic skin trade. Finally, we pool resources for industry-wide work that are less feasible, just one company on its own or each company on its own. If we sum that up in a mutualized model, we can have more resources and more impact ultimately down the line. Finally, I would just say that this is some of the scope of species and, you know, Dan and Pat will talk about this uh, in, 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 as they lead the scientific support, understanding, and ongoing field work that we do every year to understand and ensure uh, their responsible and sustainable trade. So with this, uh, I'll just thank you and uh, pass it on again to Dan uh, and looking forward to, to the conversation. Wonderful, thanks, buddy. Well, th thank, thank you, Nicholas. You've turned it up in my absence. Thanks, guys. Um, so Nicholas has provided the framework about what SARCA does, but I'm sure you're all thinking, yeah, that's great, but what do you actually do? What do you do on the field? What do you do to make sure that you can evidence these lofty claims that you're putting forward? And I want to show you and speak a little bit to what we are doing on the ground. If you have any questions, or if something doesn't make sense, please just interrupt me. Lift up your hand. I'm going to show you with photos mainly because they tend to speak louder than words. So we produce risk assessments. If you are a company using exotic skins, I won't lie, there are some risks. The People's Democratic Republic of Laos has some practices that we would not, from a scientific perspective, consider to be um, appropriate. Um, that's also true of some supply chains in China. In other countries, there are large trades in meat and domestic trade in skins that those skins will never come to Europe. They'll never be seen by a European tannery or a luxury brand. They're used for domestic purposes. And some of those supply chains, sure, they do not meet the standards that we would deem to be acceptable. And they're typically the ones that you see in the videos from the Humane Society and Peter that say Gucci's supply chain or Louis Vuitton supply chain. That's not true, but it tells a good story. And these are also some of the industries that are taking place in parallel. And so we want to give those members that are part of SARCA an idea of where are the good places to source, where are the not so good places, and what are the risks involved. We've produced a lot of guidance, particularly for countries in Southeast Asia, government authorities in Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. We do much of the on-site field science that helps to underpin the evidence base to say that this trade is sustainable. We do a lot of work with local people 
in processing facilities. We can learn huge amounts about the animals themselves, about the reproductive condition, for example. This is all very important information for assessing the sustainability of offtake. We can learn about what these animals are eating. From this type of science, we know that these animals are predominantly coming from oil palm plantations. They are not coming from pristine forests when we speak about these lizards here. Very common species, and through all this information, it helps to build our confidence that these harvests are sustainable. And we provide a lot of capacity development, training for local people on the ground. If you're a scientist and you have an obligation to CITES, the UN Convention on Wildlife Trade, then you need to show, you need to prove that your harvests are non-detrimental. But how do you do that? We provide those sorts of trainings. And with all that information, we get data. I'm not going to go into detail, but all of this information, again, helps to underpin what we know now. And what we know now is that these harvests have been occurring for almost 100 years. They've been occurring at high volumes for the last 50 years. And the reports, the quotas that are set, are all underpinned by this robust information that shows, yes, these animals can withstand this level of offtake. So we tick the conservation box. In terms of traceability, we've developed a mobile application. Whether you've got an Android phone or you use an Apple phone, you can freely download an application that allows data collection to take place, that allows, just like a UPS, DHL, or FedEx package, you know, when you Tra tracking your new PlayStation that you buy from the United States. It comes through and you know that it's turned up in Fort Worth and Dallas and then you know it's turned up in Sydney or wherever else. So this provides the same technology so that in real time you have an exact chain of custody for these CITES compliant tamper-proof tags that are attached to these skins, which prov again provides proof of provenance proof of provenance to facilities that are doing the right thing in terms of animal welfare, from production systems that are sustainable, and also provide that confidence and transparency um, when it comes to legal trade. We've done an enormous amount of work on animal welfare. I think it goes without saying that, given that this is an animal-based industry, Animal welfare is critical, it is paramount, and this is where most of the concerns have been raised. So we have produced guidance, we have done research, and we continue to do training in these supply chains with harvesters, with processing facilities, providing guidance documents like this. This looks gory, but this is actually a, a veterinarian, a professor of reptiles from the University of Arizona doing research on animal welfare. So better understanding how we can treat these animals throughout the production process to optimize welfare outcomes. And then, as I said, doing huge numbers of workshops, often in very remote places with one or two operators only, to teach these people, whether it be capture, whether it be transport, whether it be humane killing, what are the international standards, what are the practices that they should follow to ensure that no matter if they are small or they're big, they have the capacity and the capability, the infrastructure, to be able to do this job well in a responsible manner. And at this stage, I think we've probably trained several thousand operators throughout Southeast Asia, predominantly in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And then finally, this has culminated in an international standard called the Responsible Reptile Sourcing Standard. We need to pull all this work together. We need to provide the assurance that, yeah, you've done the trainings, 
I get it, but we need a third party to go in and verify that the practices being done on a day-to-day -day basis under that audit comply with this international standard. And this is a standard that has been produced following ICL guidelines. For those of you that know ICL, ICL has a standard on how to create standards, which we have followed. Various organizations, civil society organizations, NGOs, IGOs, United Nations bodies have been involved in the creation of this standard because inevitably this industry will be attacked. It's always being attacked. It's using exotic skins. People are spreading misinformation. They're saying things that are not true and they will attack this standard and having these organizations on board and doing the consultations that we have done throughout these countries provides that assurance and that robustness that everybody has come together, they've been able to have their say, and that science underpins this work from a broad spectrum of different organizations to build what is a credible, robust standard that will hopefully provide that assurance to buyers, to the consumer that the practices that are happening in these reptile skin supply chains are very much real. So thank you. I, I'm, perhaps I'll leave questions to the end because we, we're not taking too long. Um, now I'm going to pass over to Dr. Patrick Ost. So as you can see, a lot of work has been done in this space, and he wants to double back and I guess double down on why reptiles are an incredible investment for the future, not just for skins. Most of these trades, regardless of whether skins are used, they will continue. If all the brands and all the tanneries decide no more, these animals will still be killed for their meat, they'll still be killed for their medicinal value and probably a domestic trade in skins. And there is a huge amount of potential in reptiles that is waiting to be unlocked. And we as conservationists and people who are interested and concerned about issues like climate change and so on are investigating through research the potential of reptiles for safeguarding the future. And Dr. Patrick Ost will speak to you about that now. Uh, you, it, I'll just, yep. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so perhaps to kick off, I'd like to ask a very simple question. What is sustainability? What does sustainability mean to you here sitting today? What does it mean for your businesses? Well, at this stage, at this very moment in time, we're starting to get the idea that it's clearly a very important business function. But how do we address these issues? How do we actually get to grips with them and meet these sustainability criteria? It's an awfully big monster to get your head around. Yeah, you may be able to address your, your CO2 footprint, but what about biodiversity? Have you, di have you effectively and explicitly addressed your biodiversity footprint? I would suggest here today that for many of you, the case is maybe not so. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to try and show you how this group of animals can help you get there. A straight line from point A to point B. A one-stop shop for you to address all the multiple little sustainability criteria that you may possibly conceivably imagine. Why now is a very good time to invest in reptiles. <clears throat> a quick overview, simplified overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Chapter one, why now? Simply, what we have, our traditional systems are no longer working. How does it work? Well, reptiles are tailor-made for global challenges. Who benefits? Those who need it most. 
essentially the tropics. And when can we start? A question Dan, I think, has just answered right now. We have everything ready to go. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Why now? Quite simply, our agri-food systems are failing hopelessly. I don't need to go into detail here. I'm sure most of you watch the news from time to time. Three key areas. Resource limitations. We simply don't have the land, fresh water, soils, we just heard earlier on this talk today, to produce what the planet is demanding. Our population is expected to reach 9 billion by 2050. Already about a quarter of our children, mainly in the global south, are facing acute food insecurity. And quite simply, we don't have, using the systems we have at our fingertips right now, we don't have what it takes to meet those challenges. Climate change. Our planet is getting hotter. Droughts, heat waves, floods, all these extreme events are becoming more frequent, more impactful. It's becoming more and more difficult for us to produce food under these extreme conditions. And lastly, disease. Our entire food systems depend on a handful of species with very similar biologies. Take our protein systems, for example. Cows, sheep, chickens, ducks, and maybe a handful of others. They all have similar warm-blooded physiologies to our own. They all carry very similar diseases. And essentially, we're sitting on a time bomb. We are literally one mutation away from another COVID-type pandemic. So what makes reptiles so special? Why should they be the solution we should be looking at? It's essentially because they have very different and very unique credentials to what we have at the moment. Credentials that are tailor-made for global challenges. Energy efficiency, they are pro-poor, and they are highly resilient. They are resilient specialists built to cope with extreme environments. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about each of these. Energy efficiency, pro-poor, and resilience. Reptiles are essentially solar-powered. They get 90% of their metabolic energy requirements directly from the sun or the ambient temperature around them. Being Italy, I'm sure many of you here are familiar with the sight of a lizard basking in the sun or a turtle hauled out on the side of a pond basking in the sun. They're not doing it to get a suntan to look good. They're charging their batteries. They're powering up their metabolism. And as a result of using the sun's energy, they require 90% less food than a similar-sized bird or mammal, warm-blooded animal. Now, if you're a farmer, you will understand the significance of what I've just said. This is massive. If you can have a livestock animal that eats 90% less food and produces the same output, that is a game-changer. Right there, that is a game-changer. But it doesn't end there. These animals have been evolving towards resource efficiency for millions of years, since the day of the dinosaurs. They have extremely efficient digestive systems. Some species have digestive efficiencies of 98%. In a commercial production environment, food conversion ratios can reach one to one. For every kg of food you put in, you get a kg of product at the other end. These are incredible figures when you're looking at farming systems. And of course, coming together, when you eat very little and you are so efficient, you produce very little waste. The pollution risk associated with reptile production systems is virtually nil. They produce very little pollution and very few greenhouse gases. No nitrous oxide, no methane, or at least very little, and very little CO2. 
In essence, they are 100% aligned with nature-based solutions and regenerative agriculture. Two themes, I'm sure, in the sustainability arena, many of you are already familiar with. As Dan mentioned earlier on, they contribute directly to conservation of biological diversity. Okay, Dan. Reptiles are cold-blooded animals. They like the warmth, and as such, they occur in their greatest diversity and their greatest abundance in the tropics. This is a part of, a, of the world where a billion people, at least a billion people, consider reptiles part of their staple diet, part of their culinary traditions. They look at reptiles in the same way that people from the west or the temperate climates look at cows or sheep. So why haven't we heard more about this? Well, the sad reality is reptile-based diets have been discriminated against. The tropics were largely colonized by temperate countries. And when those temperate countries colonized the tropics, they took with them their home comforts. They took with them their cows and their sheep and by and large, they tried to do away with those exotic an anomalies that they didn't quite get their heads around. Pythons were traditionally eaten across most of Africa. But unfortunately, colonialism has been outlawing the practice since as far back as the 1960s. Today, the consumption of python meat in Zimbabwe, for example, is still illegal. It carries a penalty of a two-year sentence. Small-scale reptile farming systems and wild harvests require very little, they require very few resources, very little capital investment. They're very cheap and easy to run, even in remote and isolated parts of the world where few other industries can gain traction. And as such, they bring very unique benefits in terms of access to foreign currency and commodity markets to those communities, those marginalized communities that often live in these remote and isolated areas. And then finally, the third one, resilience. Reptiles are what we call extremophiles. They have able to They've been able to persist alongside warm, high-octane, warm-blooded animals simply because they've evolved to live in those fringe niches, habitats. This is why countries like Australia are synonymous with crocodiles and big lizards and giant pythons. They can survive long periods with no food. Many, most reptiles can survive many months with no food, and some can survive up to two years with no food. They require very little water. Some species don't need any drinking water at all, provided their food contains enough moisture. They can exploit a three-dimensional environment to ex ex um, es escape extreme events. Now, this may sound trivial, but the, reality, the practical reality on the ground is it stands in your favor if you are able to live deep underground just as easily as you can in the treetops. And this is a very unique phenomenon amongst the reptiles. Many of them can do this. They're aquatic, they're terrestrial, they are boreal, they can just practically go anywhere. And finally, because of their very different cold-blooded physiology, they very seldomly transmit warm-blooded diseases. In fact, the European Union has done a study on this, and the most dangerous disease associated with reptiles is salmonella. And this is a very common foodborne bacterial infection that in most cases is very easy and simple to treat. But reptiles have never been linked to any dangerous pandemics, viruses, bird flu, swine flu, SARS, MERS, Ebola, COVID. They've never been linked to any of those. Now, chapter four is responsible sourcing, but before I move on to chapter four, I'm gonna break for a bit just to have a look at the brief history 
of reptile leather in fashion. And the reason why is I think the history of reptile leather in fashion can tell us much about where we are today. And not only that, it can perhaps give us a glimpse of where we are moving to in the future. So reptiles in fashion essentially began in earnest in about the 1920s, the golden age of luxury uh, reptile leather. This is when luxury fashion embraced leather as a key identifier, it became known as precious, a precious leather in the same way that diamonds are, are synonymous with luxury. It's also the same time that we see the emergence or the evolution of mass media. And this mass media through television and radio and print essentially takes uh, exotic leathers and their association with luxury to a global audience. And of course, you, you could barely have mass media without celebrities, the emergence of celebrities. And of course, the moment the celebrities got hold of uh, luxury leather, uh, exotic leather products, they became I I iconic, and their status was solidified in history. But unfortunately, the golden age comes to an end in about the 1960s. This is when we see the start of the red age, a time of public action, the birth of these movements like the animal rights movement, public campaigning, public protest, we see people to, starting to become a little bit more conscious about the, the impacts of consumerism and what it could be doing to our now fragile planet. And luxury brands begin to scrutinize their use of animal-based products. And this, I guess, sort of culminated towards the end of the last decade with a number of luxury brands actually dropping the use of exotic uh, leathers altogether. But thankfully, that age has now come to the end, and we are now in what we'd like to call the Green Age. And this, I guess, was brought on somewhat by COVID, but not entirely. And this is a time where the luxury fashion brands, the luxury fashion industry starts to really embrace the idea of sustainability as a core business function. It's also a time where science really gets behind the idea of sustainable use. The sustainable use of animal-based products is now a cornerstone of key initiatives like the Global Development Goals, the Convention of Biological Diversity Framework. It is now considered essential if we are going to reach our sustainability targets. And as Dan just mentioned, it also coincides with a time of responsible sourcing, an age where we now have supply chains that meet international standards, supply chains of reptile products that are very closely aligned with the same standards we see in the mainstream livestock sector. So responsible sourcing, I'm not going to dwell on this because I think Dan has covered it at length, but essentially we now have responsible su supply chains for a wide range of reptile-based products. All the efforts that we've been working at over the last several years have culminated in this, in this standard, this responsible reptile sourcing standard. And this, by, without wanting to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet, this really is a gold standard in standards, simply because it works so hard to try and synergize all those different criteria that collectively make up sustainability. It pays massive consideration to things like um, the livelihoods of marginalized rural communities living in remote landscapes and the conservation of biological diversity focusing on those habitats and species that are most vulnerable. And so really what I can say is if you bore into the science of reptile leather, you really do realize that it is a hyper-sustainable product. The future of reptile leather is absolutely bulletproof. It is completely immune to greenwashing. It is the real authentic thing. It has, it has provenance. It has the science. All that's left for me to say is we would love you to join us. If you 
used to use exotic leather in the past, or maybe you've dropped it, or maybe you're considering using it, or indeed if you are, we would love to hear from you. We would love to engage with you and illustrate to you how we can take supply chains and absolutely leverage opportunities and sustainability to maximize your efforts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Pat. That is, uh, every time I hear Pat speak, it gives me that motivation and that passion to keep on doing what we do. And it is not just about reptile leather. As I said, we're conservationists. We're not here to make, with the greatest respect, rich European companies more money. It's not our MO. It's not what we're trying to achieve. But it's because you were engaged in, and you're only just a part Exotic skin trade, as we see it, is a part of this industry that involves meat, that involves medicines, and that has such incredible credentials. And the fact that this industry is linked into that, it's a very special thing, and it's something that should be nurtured. And so the title of this talk today was Exotic Skins, Conservation and Livelihoods, or Animal Rights. And let's be honest. Animals are dying to produce meat. Animals are dying to produce skins, to produce medicines. That's a fact. It's something that should be brought out in the open, openly discussed. And people say, oh, how dare you? That's unethical. And that's a fair point of view. I guess what we are trying to say is, whose ethics? When we know and science has shown that livelihoods are at stake, that climate change and serious global challenges are at stake, that conservation of species and habitats are at stake, what about the ethics involved in protecting those good things? And so if you are involved in this trade, I don't know who's here today, but if you're involved in this trade, and even if you're not, I would say that please do pass on this message. As Pat said, you've heard about this. We want you to make this your story, because it is the story. And don't just take our word for it. Go away, do your homework, and you'll understand that truly the evidence underpinning this industry is substantial. And it is not just now something that we suggest you to do. We suggest that it's an imperative. It's a duty. It's an obligation for you to share this truth and to share this story. So thank you very, very much. For your time today. If you have any questions, we'd love to answer them, even if they're controversial. I stood up here giving a speech and someone said, excuse my French, we're all adults, she said, you're fucking sick. And it generated a great discussion. It was really good to be able to go back and forth. So please don't be shy. If you have any questions, please do let us know and we'll do our very best to answer them for you. Thank you for your time. Probably more of amusing than a question, but I did find it interesting um, your comment on how um, colonialism probably impacted the way we view these exotics. And I think that with the consumer, it's a, there's a lot about reshaping what an exotic really is. Because I mean, I'm from Australia. We use a lot of kangaroo, and that offends so many people. <laughs> but when you're from Australia, you know that it's a pest, and it's been killed by the indigenous populations for so many years. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting that you bring that up because I think reframing how we view animals and how we seem to rank them um, in terms of, you know, how ethical it is to kill them would be really important in making this a bit more, I don't know, easy to stomach for the consumer? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a fabulous point. And kangaroos are a great example. There are lobby groups in the United States dedicated to lobbying the Australian government to stop killing kangaroos. There are, what, 60 million kangaroos in Australia? You drive from the south coast of New South Wales to Canberra and you'll see 200 dead kangaroos on the road. And yet there are people out there, dedicated groups, investing millions of dollars, telling the world that these animals are going extinct because of a trade in leather and meat in Australia. And this industry has the same issue. It's because of, you know, we are foisting 
Western colonial opinions on, Australia is not the best example perhaps, but you take Africa, you take Latin America, people don't want to eat cows. I mean, I shouldn't speak badly about cows at a leather fair, but people don't want to eat corn. It's a monoculture of maize. The landscape has been blitzkrieg. Nothing lives there. Herbicides, pesticides, and yet, you know, again, forgive me if you're vegan or vegetarian, everything has its place, but nothing is black and white. This is nuanced. This is a really difficult, counterintuitive message to get across. Kill some animals and save the rest? People can't get their heads around it, and so the messaging is critically important, and also bringing ourselves out of that Manhattan, London, Parisian, Milan mindset and bringing ourselves into the tropics and understanding that this is how people live. It's how they want to live and it's incredibly sustainable, far more sustainable than what we're doing in the West, yet we stand up telling them to follow us. And so it's a fantastic point. This really is entrenched in not just this industry, that's a global problem, but it is a very real problem. Great question, thank you. Anyone else have any quick questions? All right, folks, without further ado, we'll close, but thank you very much for joining us and for your time.